Hey everyone, I'm Annie Dickerson and on behalf of the entire Good Egg Investments team, I wanted to welcome you to this episode of The Life & Money Show, the show where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design and everything in between. I'm here, of course, with my amazing co-host, Susan Elliott. Susan, how are you today? I always like straighten up just a little bit when you say that, like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I am here. I'm doing really good this morning. It's um, Tuesdays are like a fun, busy day, but we get to talk to people and have great idea sessions. It's like got a great, great Tuesday energy over here. Indeed. Well, we just wrapped a great conversation with our guest, Charles Carrillo, which uh, we're going to dive into in a little bit here. But tell everybody a little bit about what we're going to be talking about on the show today. Charles was a great guest and he's um he does very similar things to us here at Good Egg and what's really wonderful is that his backstory gave you know this wonderful window into the life of like how we all find real estate investing and there's so much that I we can all resonate from that and what I really loved is like his insights and experience as far as like what we're exposed to as kids and how that can make a huge difference where we end up as adults. I think about that every day as I I wrangle my kids around the house, as we choose activities and things for them to get into um, and and thinking about like having helping them get started along the way. A big motivator for my investing is that I'm setting them, them up to be able to have these decisions and create their wealth for them themselves. I want to give them some wealth to be the seed, but I want to more so I want to teach them how to build wealth, um, not just hand it to them. And Charles has some great stories about how he experienced that as a kid and and how that led to where he's at. And then the second big part of where we got into it today is um, the whole aspect of foreign investors and how helping them get into the U.S. real estate market, um, something we take for granted, I think, living here in the U.S., that it's, it's an incredibly more or less stable assets class that that we're able to get into and leverage in our wealth building process. And I and, and we talk a little bit about his travel experiences and how he's integrated that into his professional life entre- as an entrepreneur and building businesses. I really liked his one um, tip at the end for how to how to set yourself up for success to be able to to travel at any point you want. He has one criteria that really, really hit home for me. Yeah. Yeah. We covered so much in this episode. And, you know, the thing about the foreign investments is, you know, I, we looked into this years ago um, when we first launched Good Egg and it was not that easy. You had to, if I remember correctly, you had to travel to the U S to, to set up a bank account. That was like a big hurdle um, to getting started. Um, But the process that Charles talks about now, because a lot of things have changed over the last um, several years. And so it's become much easier. So anybody can do it from anywhere. So if you're listening to this and you're not based in the U.S., but you've been curious about investing in U.S. real estate, um, listen through because Charles will talk about the process um, that you can go through to actually invest in U.S. real estate. Uh, But before we dive in, and we're going to cover a lot here, but before we dive in, if you are, whether you're a foreign investor or you're um, based in the U.S. and you're interested in investing alongside us in U.S.-based real estate, mostly multifamily and some hotels as well, to diversify your portfolio, perhaps out of the stock market, or maybe you have some rental properties and you want to, you know, take your foot off the pedal a little bit and be uh, more of a passive investor. Uh, We would love to have you within the Good Egg community. A great place to get started is to join our Good Egg Investor Club. It's a community of investors just like you who are looking to build wealth for their families. So to get started, you can go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And within that page, if you are a foreign investor, there's a survey that you can fill out to get in touch with us and let us know um, so that we can reach out and support you in that process. All right, with that, let's dive into our conversation with Charles Carrillo. Charles, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're fantastic. We are so excited to have you here. You have quite a story. You've you've done so much travel. You've built up multiple businesses. And so 
We definitely want to hear more and dig into your inspirational story. I want to start with, you know, kind of how you got started, specifically with real estate, because it's not something everybody gets into. How did real estate come to be part of your journey? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in a real estate family. My dad has been a uh, multifamily investor since 1984, and those properties were they're really they're really tough properties. They were mainly D. I to be nice, let's say C minus. And um, but I remember he self managed them, and he had with he had some of them with a partner, and they had up to like upwards of maybe a hundred units before he started selling them in the late 90s. But um, he he had like a small team that he put together to manage them. But every, we would go there like twice a week to different properties and. And I was Ooh, like, this is like, see lots this is of terrible. Things, I'm, sure. <laughs> this, I'm like, this You're is like, like the I worst thing. I never want to do this. <laughs> like, this is like the worst thing I've ever seen. But it was, you know, you're young, you put, you know, and then it's different because you go to your friend's houses and, uh, you know, they're more, ed, you know, they have uh, more professional parents, let's just say, um, that have gone to, uh, they're not attorneys or like, so all this kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, this looks more like straightforward. Like, you know what I mean? Coming in at this time. And my dad's at all different times getting calls and stuff like this. And um, I think it was like in high school, I started like putting two and two together because, you know, my, my dad would be able, we had a summer house that was like three and a half hours away. He'd be able to like go up there for like weeks at a time. He was able to, we went like a road trip when I was like in elementary school across the United States, like different stuff like this that no one else I knew had ever done. So it was like, you start putting them together. My dad never missed like anything. Like I'm an Eagle Scout. So like Boy Scouts, nothing was ever missed. Any, I played lacrosse in high school and college, nothing was ever missed. And it was like, you didn't get, you didn't see that from other parents, no matter what their profession was. So I That's saw that. So and interesting I was like, that you yeah. saw the parents that had these like traditional, easy looking paths. And then this messy path that your dad had, but then you had that epiphany later on of like, Ooh, wait a minute, this path actually leads to the kind of freedom and lifestyle that I want, as opposed to maybe those lawyers who were still working 80 hour weeks. Yeah. Driving really fancy cars, but uh, and nice suits, but they came in like you know seven thirty at night, stuff like that, and you'd be over at your friend's house, you know, like, oh, my dad's been home since like two thirty. So it's like you know, it's um, it was like a a different thing, and that you know that you, know, you don't really put it together, and uh, until you're a little older and you're kind of like seeing stuff, but when you when you talk about it more and more, then you're like, wow, this is just like it was who it couldn't be eye opening. But I remember my dad collecting rent one time, and um, he's like telling me like half of everything that's collected is profit. And so it would be like, you know, like you see that in, yeah, I don't know, you know, he's like this, this building pays for your braces. I remember him telling me one time. So it was like <laughs> something like that. It's kind of brought back yeah. to your level of like a middle schooler. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, I understand this now. Like, I understand how this all works and everything's put together and it's not traditional, but like, now I know why you've done it. And um, so, yeah, that was that. And then, I mean, I got out of college um, in 06. My dad really pressured me to buy a property. So I bought, he was pressuring back. Now we call it house hacking, but back then it was just like buying a multifamily, small one that you could get FHA financing for. So it was a three family. I lived in one of the floors, rented out the other two. Um, I did it again at the end of 08, which was completely different from the end of 06. Let's just say that. Um, every every time you turned on the TV, it was like, I mean, CNBC, it was just like, every, this was like two months. I remember the second property bought was two months after Lehman, and it was like two months before it made off. So it was just like, every time you turned it on, something was going down. Someone went bankrupt. Investors were losing money. And then um, it didn't get better for many years. And it was just like, uh, did it? Were your did the friends at that point? I'm curious. So were your because you were still in your, your early 20s, I assume, yeah. at that point. So were your friends like, what are you doing, man? Like you're buying <laughs> all this real estate. Have you seen the news? Like the world is falling apart. Or did you did you have people around you who were like, oh, that's so cool. I want to buy real estate too. I had one of my really good friends, he was working, he got a job at a private equity firm, very traditional type, uh, you know, Connecticut uh, college person. And it was like, <laughs> and it was, uh, he, he was just like, he was asking some of the numbers and he was like, I had never even heard what IRR was before. I never, still didn't understand what it was or he's done. And I was like, man, it's not that difficult. Like I got this, there's rent, there's expenses. Like I had this really simple, like it was like on a Word document spreadsheet I showed this guy. And he's like, well, you know, we put it in here for time value of money. I'm like, it's a three family apartment. It's not, like, you know, like I was just like, as my dad was, I was a back of the napkin type investor. You know what I mean? Like IRR, I don't know anything about that. I know cash on cash. I know, I know like interest rate, like, you know, I know. And like, that was kind of how I started out. And um, you got to get a little bit more sophisticated if you want to start taking people's money. But it was something that at that point it was, um, 
Yeah, it was it was just, you know, pretty straightforward. You know what I mean? I bought them very close to each other, literally like less than a half mile from each other so I could manage both of them. And uh, you learn a lot when you self-manage property. I mean, it's just, especially they were C-class properties. My dad really pushed me to buy better properties. And they were, they were like C, then I bought a C-plus type thing. And they're better. They're much better than the ones he had. But, you know, as I've like really gone through in my real estate career, it's more like all now into Bs and stuff like this. You realize that the consistency and the tenant base and how it makes it so much stronger for you, for you, and then also easier for you, and then also stronger investment for your investors as well. So the, the natural progression, I don't think anybody really starts off with A's. It's really just like, you know, they start on their way up and then uh, hopefully they're not starting in D. Hopefully they start in C though, but. Very cool, very cool. What, how um, have you helped people like overcome that challenge? What are some steps that they've taken to be able to invest in US real estate? Um, usually if, usually the usual, progression of how this works is that, um, first of all, when they, if I have an investor that comes to us, whether they want to be active or passive, um, I don't really speak to too many active investors that much anymore, That, but with passive investors that come to us, what really happens is that, um, first of all, I'll just connect them. If you're, if, if you want to be active or passive, if you reach out to me, I can send you a list of different uh, accountants, attorneys we use. Most of them are here in Florida, but uh, they work all over the United States, uh, depending on where you want to invest. And so, But usually, that's the first thing I do is I'll give them a list of different accountants and attorneys that they have to reach out to. And then I'll kind of go through the normal progression of how this works is, first of all, they'll set up with their... They have to get an IT number, which is like individual tax ID number here in the United States. Um, you know, They want to work through one of those professionals because it really speeds up the process. Uh, and it's, but still now working with one of those professionals, it's pretty takes long. It's like seven to 11 weeks as of like the IRS website recently. So it, it's quite the process. And then after that, it's usually now they're coming in as really, that's kind of like having their SS number for us, social security number, where they can now set up their corporation. And the entity structure is a little different because there's some of these things that they have to watch out for. So here in the United States, federally, let's just say every state might be a little different, but um, Currently, right now, we have like an estate tax that's like $11 million or something, right? So if for foreign investors, it's like 60000 So it is something that they have to be very careful. $60,000, I mean, you can make that in no time um, if you're investing into real estate over a few years. You know what I mean? You don't need like the, the best deal ever. That can just happen. So it's something that you have to be really know about and you have to speak to the professional and really figure out exactly what entity is best. But after that, what happens is that um, entity is set up. They set up a bank account. There's a number of different banks that work with foreign investors. So people that might not be based here in the United States, but might just have a corporation used to be difficult a few years back, but now there's a number of different, especially online banks. And then after that, now they have their US um, entity, they have their US bank account, and now they can just use that as kind of like their holding company. So they can passively invest in syndications. They can invest in anything, but whatever they want to, right? Using that setup, um, they want to open up a brokerage account, whatever they like to do, um, or they can use it as the holding company for buying a property here in the United States. And um, when one of the big things when I speak to syndicators and like, okay, like this, this makes sense. Like I understand this. There's a couple extra steps is number one is that um, we never want to accept any money from foreign entities. We want to make sure that the money, the wires are coming from US entities. And that's twofold. Number one is because they've done what banks call KYC, like know your customer. And the second thing is that um, because we're not able to do that as syndicators, we don't have access to, um, I'll just mention like Bank of America is so like, you know, KYC department of checking where money comes from. And the second thing too, is that um, everybody knows that syndicating, uh, as you're getting closer to that deadline, people like to send in their wires. And um, I've known a couple of people that have had wires that they sent in, people actually sent them and they got held up because one of the company names that they were sending from foreign was like, had, was on some sort of blacklist right um of something and then like the money gets held and now what do you do when you're trying to close on a property so it's like just accept it from us entities coming in um and after that it's pretty much straightforward everything else runs the same the syndicators you know they have to speak to their accountant they might have to do some sort of a withholding on those investors um but other than that it's a pretty straightforward process there are a bunch of syndicators that don't like doing it and there's a bunch that do so it's something that um, if you do want to if you're a syndicator it's a great way of really opening up um people to invest with you and as a foreign investor just making sure that people are aware of that upfront that you are a foreign investor um and you know with a us entity or whatever it might be um that allows you to be entered into a lot more deals than you previously might not be able to 
So it sounds like no matter where somebody lives, they don't necessarily need to come and live here in the U.S. or even visit to set everything up. They can do everything virtually. Is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Used to be with the bank accounts, it would be difficult, but everything else can be done. And now that... um, most people are using an agent or an attorney to set up all their stuff. Mm-hmm. Like they're, you know, your corporations, just like you and I would, um, they can do the same thing. 